I'm Rael at Third Love. I'm the co-founder and chief creative officer. We'll be talking to our friends from Living Beyond Breast Cancer today, um, Jean Sachs. I'm so excited for you guys to meet her and learn um, everything that you need to know about breast cancer and um, finding, making sure that you're getting tested and taking care of you. While we're waiting for her to join, um, I just wanted to speak about why breast cancer is really is she on? Okay, never mind. I won't tell. I won't tell you guys why breast cancer is really close to my heart. Hi, Jean. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm so good. We're so thrilled to have you here today um, and speaking with us. Tell us more about living beyond breast cancer and your role there. Sure. I'm, this is my first Instagram live, so Yay! thank you for giving me. I'm doing a lot of Facebook, but not Instagram. Um, so. Yeah, so I'm the CEO of Living Beyond Breast Cancer. We're so happy to be partnering with Third Love again. Um, it's a wonderful partnership. We are a national nonprofit, and our entire mission is to connect people impacted by breast cancer with trusted information and a community of support. Um, so what does that mean? It means when you're diagnosed, it's pretty overwhelming. You're getting a lot of information that's new, it's scary, and we're a place you can come to to really understand things, um, get connected to a really supportive community. And we can help you navigate throughout the process and stay with you hopefully for many, many, many years. I love that, such important work. Um, it really hits close to home. At Third Love, we really try to use our platform to amplify um, issues that are important to women. And I can't think of a more important um, issue than breast cancer itself and really making sure that we're amplifying it to our community, um, not only today, but over um, this entire month of Breast Cancer Awareness Month and all year round. So um, tell me, how did you get involved with living beyond breast cancer? What has your journey been personally? Sure. Um, I'm going to age myself. but that's <laughs> okay. So I, I have actually been with living beyond breast cancer for well over 20 years. Um, but my career really started, I have, um, I have actually a, a, I'm a social, I have a master's in social work and law and social policy, but always entered that because I knew I wanted to, I was always really passionate about women's health, probably really starting with reproductive rights, but then, you know, changing it to women's health in general. Um, I worked for a state senator for a couple of years um, on a bunch of women's health legislation, and one of them was the Mammography Quality Assurance Act, because actually in the early 90s, there were no standards for mammogram facilities. So we were putting forth legislation to make sure that happened. Um, and then I worked for the National Breast Cancer Coalition, which was an advocacy organization, and then really found my professional home at Living Beyond Breast Cancer, which when I started was tiny. <laughs> you know, I had one staff person and um, I'm really proud that today, you know, we reach over 600,000 people a year. And um, during that time, breast cancer has really changed. Um, and we now know breast cancer isn't one disease. So our, our work has become much more complicated and much more important when a woman is diagnosed. So true. Um, my mom was diagnosed in the mid 90s. And just even the informa information that's available to me now um, would have been game changing for her. So I, I would love to hear, um, I know that this is a big question, but when you look at your time throughout living beyond breast cancer, what, um, what is one thing that you're just really, really proud of that you've been able to accomplish? I know that one thing question. That one is, thing, I know. <laughs> is, oh, I'm um, you know, to be honest, I am a, I'm a, I'm a one-on-one -on -one connection person. So, you know, for me, what I'm most, most proud of is all the individuals we have been able to touch. And when they hang up the phone or close the Facebook page or whatever, they say, I feel so much better. I know how to take the next step. Thank I don't know what I would have done. Um, because I think at the end of the day, when you're facing any kind of crisis, I mean, it doesn't have to be breast cancer. It could be any kind of health or personal crisis, you know, if you have information and you have support, you just do better. And that's what we do every day. <laughs> and I think I'm just really proud that we, we feel like if we touch one person, that's important. If we help 100,000, 600,000, that's important. But 
we really believe everybody's story is unique and, and important. Yeah, it really is. And I mean, with so much, you mentioned this before, so much information that's out there. How do you know where to go, how to find these trusted resources? What are some things, um, some helpful tips that you can give to our, um, the, to the people who are watching? Yeah, I think we always say, you know, don't trust Dr. Google. It is really easy to <laughs> Google breast cancer. Yeah. And I think you can get like, I don't know, over a million responses. Um, and you, you want to get to information that is trusted and reliable. Um, so obviously, I think living beyond breast cancer's information is reliable. But, but there's lots of other places from, you know, the NIH and NCI and Memorial mm -hmm. Sloan Kettering, you know, trusted cancer centers. Uh, but what you don't want to do is just go down that Google rabbit hole and get a lot of information that may not be relevant to you. And sort of, as I said at the beginning, you know, breast cancer isn't one disease. Um, it's many diseases. So we won't have one cure. We'll have multiple cures. So that really means when you're diagnosed, you have to know what your subtype is, what your stage is. Do you have a genetic disposition, mutation um, that caused your breast cancer? Because your story gets really narrow. You know, in the beginning, it's sort of this wide bucket. And then it's like, you have to get the information that's relevant to you. So I would say only go to trusted sources um, and really find a doctor you trust because that's who's going to navigate um, you through the process. Definitely. Well, tell us a little bit more of what are the different types of breast cancer? You know, you said that there are many diseases within this umbrella of breast cancer. How do, how do you define those? Yeah, I mean, it used to be, you know, breast cancer was just breast cancer and we mm -hmm. treated it all the same. Um, you know, Dr. Susan Love used to just say slash burn and poison and that's how we treated it. So now what we know is, um, you know, the most common kind of breast cancer is hormone sensitive. So that means mm -hmm. estrogen and, and progesterone are really feeding the cancer. So that's ER, PR positive breast cancer. There's also um, a, a type called HER2 positive, which, um, is a protein that is involved in, in the cancer. And then there's triple negative, where we don't know exactly what's feeding the cancer, we're learning more. And so those are kind of the three big ones that you'll find out. And then there's many, many others that are smaller. And then a lot of people always say when they were diagnosed with breast cancer, you know, it's not in my family. I can't believe I got this. And I think it's really important to know that less than 9% of breast cancers are genetic. So the vast majority, there is no family history. But if you do have that genetic mutation, your risk of breast cancer is much, much higher. So um, you really need to find out if there's either a lot of breast cancer in your family or if you're an Ashkenazi Jew, um, then you really need to think about getting tested. So you gotta talk to your family, but most right. breast cancers, we don't know where they come from. Yeah. yeah, that can be daunting. And speaking of daunting, during COVID-19, <laughs> right? What the heck is going on out there? Um, you know, it can be a deterrent for going to the doctor, for having your regular checkups. I mean, I, I, I'm almost uh, not ashamed to admit this, but um, knowing, you know, I'm two months behind right now on my mammogram for my yearly mammogram, um, because I haven't wanted to go in during COVID. So what are your, what's kind of your advice or tips? Who should get tested during these times and make sure that they get tested? Who can maybe wait a couple of months? Um, any guidance there? Yeah, I mean, I think in general, you know, depending on your age and your family history and sort of what your protocol has been, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's probably okay to be two months late. I think you're okay with two, maybe even three maybe even six, but you don't want to miss an entire year. And I think what we're really concerned about is if you always got your mammogram in March and you didn't get it this March because of the pandemic, mm -hmm. you don't want to wait until next March um, because that's just too long. And we already know there's going to be a spike, not just with breast cancer, but other kinds of cancers where regular screening makes a difference. Um, so I would say in most places, I know that pandemic is different depending on where you are in the country. But hospitals and, and healthcare providers are really doing everything they can to keep you safe. Um, I went for my mammogram, I was a few days late. You know, they called me when I, I called when I got there from the car, I went in, I was the only one there. I was in and out in 15 minutes. 
Um, so I would say don't wait, um, especially if you're someone who's being followed more closely. Okay, definitely. Um, thank you. That is great advice, and I will go. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I will take that advice. We'll give you two more months, but then you have okay. to go. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, so let's talk about diagnosis, right? So when someone first learns or is first diagnosed, what um, – you know, where should, where, do, where do they go? What's their first step? Obviously they've seen a doctor to find that out, but what, what's a, what's a great next step to help guide them through the process? Yeah. So many women are, you know, the first, you know, sometimes they find the lump on their own or maybe their gynecologist or primary care physician finds it. Maybe it's picked up on a mammogram. Um, but often you're going to get to a surgeon first, um, and that might be the first person who gives you, you know, who will do a biopsy and give you the diagnosis. Um, so I think that person is important to kind of help you understand what you're really, what, with the information they have at that point, what you're facing. Um, we really encourage anyone who's diagnosed with breast cancer to have a consult with a medical oncologist before they have surgery, because there are lots of changes that have happened. Um, and I think, as we said before, you know, you want to educate yourself, but you want to educate yourself once you have all the information about your specific diagnosis. I think it is absolutely the hardest time when you are diagnosed and waiting to start your treatment. I think that's where women have the most anxiety because you know you have cancer in your body, but you haven't, you don't have a plan yet. Um, and so that's where connecting to a community like Living Beyond Breast Cancer can be helpful. We find that once you get your treatment plan in place, a lot of women just kind of get in the, in the mode of doing what they need to do and their anxiety actually drops. That makes sense. I mean, um, we're all so strong, right? But not being able to have a plan <laughs> and know yeah. what to do and having that kind of in-between moment um, where I imagine that you're feeling um, just just really lost um, and and potentially confused, and there's a lot of information. What are some um, additional things to consider? Um, second, third opinions. How do you kind of think about that process when somebody's first diagnosed? Yeah, you know, I think it really depends. Um, you know, some people just get to a doctor they really trust, and mm -hmm. they they feel. I think we we have to really trust our instincts, but. There, are, there have been so many advances in breast cancer treatment in the last decade that I think it is really worth, um, before you have any surgery or begin treatment, have at least one second opinion, especially if you have a more aggressive disease. Now remember, some people are gonna have a very early stage breast cancer and their treatment options are gonna be pretty straightforward. But if you have a more complicated diagnosis, if you're triple negative, if it's a large tumor, if, if they're just concerned, I think it is really important to make sure you're getting the best care. And we always say, if there is a clinical trial that works for you, you know, the only way we're going to cure breast cancer is if people participate in clinical trials. And, you know, when you've had a cancer diagnosis, you're, ne you're always going to still get standard of care. So you're always going to still get the best care, but then you're going to get an additional treatment that they're trying to figure out if it works well. And that's how all these advances have been made. So. Mm -hmm. Um, it's an amazing gift you really are giving to the next generation of women who are diagnosed. That's great. That's great advice. Um, I had never known about that, actually, participating yeah. in the clinical trials and thought about how that can impact future generations. Um, so that's great advice. And then I think, um, what about side effects? You know, I know, I know it varies dramatically depending on the treatment, um, but are there, are there tips and tricks in managing those? Um, community boards, different um, resources for women, um, I guess things that are really unknown side effects that end up occurring that you hear less about. Anything that you can just kind of say to the women out there who may be going through this right now? Yeah, so, you know, everybody's different with side effects. I can say a couple of things. No one should have nausea anymore with chemotherapy. We, we absolutely anti-nausea medications. That should not be happening. Um, I think fatigue is kind of the, 
a really big side effect that people are like, oh, you're just tired, you know, take a nap. Mm -hmm. Well, fatigue is really different than being tired. You know, if you're tired, you sleep and you wake up and you feel better. Fatigue is just that your energy is really zapped. So we've got to respect that and just take it easy and just, well, with COVID, we're all reducing what we do, but I, I think you want to reduce more. I mean, obviously the side effect of, of hair loss, which you know, I just want to make sure people know there are ways to prevent hair loss. Um, cold capping really does work. And depending on what drugs you're taking, um, it is absolutely worth trying it. And I think in, Amer in Europe and England, they've been doing this for decades. And it's just amazing how in America we've been slow to adopt. But I would talk about that because I know that hair loss isn't just about being vain. It's, it's a big part of who you are. So that's something for, for people to think about. But in general, when you're going through treatment, we always say, just be good to yourself. <laughs> uh, take, do whatever you need to do and then focus on, you know, all the other, you know, the heavy exercise, the nutrient, whatever, once you're through the treatment, but take care of yourself while you're in treatment. Um, I was reading uh, in preparation for this, I was reading a past article um, that you were featured in there's just so much great content out there um, on you and living beyond breast cancer. But I wanted to, I'm looking at my notes because I want to make sure I remember the quote exactly. But you, um, you talk about being supportive of loved ones when they're diagnosed and you used a phrase, step in, don't step away. Talk mm -hmm. to us about that and what that really means to you. Yeah, I think that, you know, it is really hard to know what to do. And I hear people say that a lot. So what you don't want to do is say, how can I help you? Instead say, you know, I was, I really love to cook. What could I make for you that you would, you would enjoy? Don't just like bring the lasagna, um, find out what they need, you know, say I could pick up your laundry tomorrow and I'll have it back to you tomorrow night. Um, but you know, really be there in that way, because I think it's a lot of a burden and women are, it's hard for us to ask for help anyway. Mm -hmm. So when some, a bunch of people are saying, what can I do? You're like, I don't know. I, I'm going to just figure it out. But when you actually start giving tangible things, I think it makes a difference. I think the other thing is, you know, cancer is only one part, part of you when you're diagnosed. So remember that they, your friends and family still want to talk about other things. They still want to have fun. They want to do things. So don't, don't feel like you have to handle them with kid gloves. Um, so I think that's what I mean by, by step in. So many of us are just, it's scary. And we're, you know, we, we just step back. Yeah. Yeah. That really, that statement really resonated with me. I was a teenager when my mom was diagnosed. And so there's only some things that I like really remember, but that was one thing that I remembered some of her friends kind of stepping away and having that be really, really hard on her. Um, because she just wanted to joke around, right? <laughs> you know, she just wanted to like have those moments of levity and talk about other things. And, um, you know, getting, I'm sure being diagnosed can feel so not normal, right? And it's so, it's so um, different than, than how you've been living life up until that point. But I think holding on to some of that normalcy and helping your loved ones hold on to some of that normalcy when they're diagnosed can be a really powerful um, can be a really powerful drug to help them recover. Yeah, absolutely. And remember, you know, many, many women work through treatment, raise their kids, sure. do things. Um, you know, it, it, it isn't like you're incapacitated all the time, you know, for early stage breast cancer. I mean, we haven't talked about metastatic, but so I think that, you know, you want to pick the moments when they're feeling well. Um, COVID does make it um, much more challenging to support people. Yeah. Well, um, I know we had kind of skipped over it before, but do you want to define um, the different stages of cancer? To... Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, there's early stage breast cancer, which is um, breast cancer that has not spread to any of your vital organs. It could have spread to your lymph nodes, but it's not in your liver, your lung, your brains, or your bones, which is where breast cancer likes to go. And so when you're diagnosed with early stage, you really are being treated hopefully for a cure. I mean, the goal is to hit you really hard with treatment um, in the hopes that, remember, all cancer cells. So it's just that one tiny cell that might have gotten out that the chemotherapy is working to, to get rid of. Um, but then those that are diagnosed with metastatic, which can happen 
immediately, like even before being di diagnosed with early stage, or it can be three, five years, any amount of time after diagnosis where you find out the cancer has moved to a vital organ. And then you're in the category that we don't have a cure, but we do have a lot of treatments that can keep you stable. And the goal is to get the cancer under control and hopefully reduce the progression. But for those diagnosed with metastatic breast cancer, they will always be in treatment. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's a very, very different diagnosis. Um, and it is something that I think the general public doesn't really get. They think breast cancer is like pink and we're running in races. Well, right. you know, it, it sadly does take the lives of, you know, 40,000 women every year. Sure. Yeah. One of the, um, one of the things that connected me with the founders of third love in the beginning was the fact that all three of us, our moms had been diagnosed with breast cancer, um, at different points of their life. And, you know, it, it was, it's a very small um, group of people, but you're like, wow, if these two people who I'm really close with, who I'm building this company with, they've also been impacted with this. It is, um, it does impact um, people that you know, obviously yourself and everyone needs to um, be really diligent and get um, screening to make sure that they're, um, that they are healthy and are able to um, get diagnosed early enough to, to really work through the treatment. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it's just super interesting of like many, many women are impacted by this every single day. Um, and I think I have like a challenge for the women who are watching if If you um, can email, text, call five women in your life today and remind them to go um, for their uh, breast cancer evaluation and make sure that they um, stay on top of that, you will make a difference, right? Because there's many people in your circle who will be impacted with breast cancer at some point in their lives, I'm sure. So I just- Yeah, wanna... I think that's important, but I, I think also just keep in mind, um, you know, mammogram is not a perfect tool. So I think we kind of have sold the American public that, you know, if you do your mammograms, you're not gonna be, you, you, you'll catch it early. So I would say the most important thing is really know your body. And uh, we often know before, long before anyone else if something's wrong. So. Definitely get the screenings that are age appropriate. Um, remember for younger women, mammogram isn't really, doesn't always work as well. Um, so know if you're at higher risk, like really understand and then pay attention to your body. Um, and then once screening makes sense, do that. I do hope over time we'll have better screening techniques um, that, that are more effective, but right now, you know, mammograms are what we have. Yeah, that's, um, that's really great advice, you're right. We do know our bodies. Yeah. And, um, really staying attuned to that is incredibly important. Um, so maybe we can uh, talk about any kind of personal stories of women that you know that have been impacted that you've come across with your work with Living Beyond Breast Cancer. I know that you mentioned for you the work is really that one on one work with women. Are there any stories um, from your experience that really stand out that you want to share? And there are, there are so many stories. <laughs> I know, I was like, how can I give you one? I, I mean, I have, uh, you know, I think I'll do them as conglomerates. Like, I think for young women that are diagnosed with breast cancer, so premenopausal women, I mean, the issues are so hard. Like, their fertility can be impacted. They can be thrown into menopause way, way earlier than they should be. So I know so many of those women who have just picked themselves up, started businesses, figured out how to live their lives, um, and and manage these side effects that, you know, are really, really do impact who you are as a woman and how you feel. Um, so I have two women that come to mind. Um, uh, my friend Dana, who was diagnosed at age 27, actually right before her wedding and said, you know what, forget the wedding, I got to fight this breast cancer, and then went on to to found a lingerie company that, you know, actually has lingerie that works for women who've had reconstruction. And um, she wanted sexy, pretty lingerie. She's like, I'm in my twenties, you know? <laughs> and, uh, you know, she's just been such an advocate. So she's one. And then um, another woman who is on my board, who was diagnosed with early stage and was doing really well, really wanted to get pregnant. So kind of did the oncofertility, froze her embryos was able to get pregnant and then at the final month of her pregnancy had back pain only to learn that her cancer had spread to her bones 
um, had to spend nearly six weeks in the hospital right after her daughter was born. But today is, you know, it's almost been a year. It's more than a year, actually. She's stable. She's a lawyer. She's back to work. And the everything these women go through, you can't imagine. And then you see them and you're like, oh, my God, you're, you know, I, you still have the will to live. And yeah. so I am just really inspired by how, how just what people go through and then and then get their lives back. And maybe their lives are totally different, but they're better. Yeah. Really inspirational. Thank you for sharing that. So um, do we have, I think we have some additional questions um, that we're going to go ahead and put up on the screen. And so what, um, what are some of the biggest myths about breast cancer that you come across? Yeah. So the first one I think I already said, which is, you know, your family history plays a big role. So, and, and connected to that is um, you can get a breast cancer gene mutation from your mother or your father. So we get half our DNA from our mom and half our DNA from our dad, which means men can carry the breast cancer mutation as well, which puts them at higher risk for breast cancer and some other cancers, but it also means they can pass it on. So when you look at your family history, don't just look at your mom's side. Um, remember 50% of your DNA from each side. Mm -hmm. I think that's a big myth. I think the other myth is, you know, I did everything right. I, I ate well, I exercised and I still got breast cancer. And I think it's really important to know that breast cancer is very complex. We don't really know what causes most breast cancers. So um, don't blame yourself for anything you did. Um, I think those are some of them. Yeah, that's great. And what, um, I know that when we think of breasts, you know, we think of women, but there's obviously men are impacted um, and the transgender community are impacted as well. So what, what percentage um, of men will get breast cancer this year? Yeah, so it's really small. About 3,000 men will be diagnosed with breast cancer annually. And, you know, for women, it's heading well over 250,000. So it is very different. Um, but... Um, but it is still important to remember that men have breast tissue and they can get breast cancer. And it's often, it's a stigma. It's hard. It's hard for them to find people mm -hmm. to connect. Some of them have the gene mutation, which is putting them at risk, but others don't. So um, I think it's important to know men have it. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, cool. Well, this was an amazing conversation. And I um, am so grateful that we were able to talk to you and get this really great information and just inspiration from you today. Is there anything that you kind of want to leave um, the audience with? Anything that we didn't cover today at the top of mind? I know there's so much, but. Um, no, I think your questions were great. I would just say, if you know anyone who's been diagnosed living beyond breast cancer, we can help you. you can go to our website. We have a lot of programs. Um, we actually have a conference at the end of the month. So I think the most important thing is, you know, don't be afraid of breast cancer, but but understand that you you wanna you wanna understand what it means. You wanna be supportive of those that are around you, um, and hopefully one day we'll go out of business because um, we'll <laughs> find the cure. <laughs> that I I hope so. Um, I think that that is a good dream to have, and thank you so much again for your time. Um, for, for everybody out there, please visit Living Beyond Breast Cancer. There's so much useful information um, there on their website and so many resources and different ways that you can help or get involved. Um, so please go check them out. And Jean, thank you very much once again. Um, it's been awesome to connect with you. And thank you. And thank you for starting a company that really puts women first and women of all body types. And it's, it's inspiring <laughs> and I love to see the company growing and, and adding to your product line. Thank you. Thanks so much. Bye, everybody.